the book of Genesis. Genesis, not the whole book. Um, Genesis 45. You might want to, I don't know, sister, you might want to turn the gain down on me a little bit. If I get talking too much louder, it'll see people are going to get a ring. They're going to hate me. Um, so it's a great privilege to be in the house of the Lord. It always is anyway. It's good to be in, in church. I'd rather be there than be anywhere at all. Church is a great place to be. Stuff happens in church. And uh, see some of you folks and wandering around. I'm surprised some of you I might see bouncing around town somewhere. I see Brother McCoy every once in a while. He was uh, driving around in his dump truck, and I'd drive around in my truck prowling around. And uh, Brother, Brother Carl, of course, I see him probably once a week at least, maybe twice, throwing tires off in his yard. And... Uh, Sometimes I have not, not, I haven't had that coast tire thing, but Wonder Auto, I have a tendency to have to go back because they get the wrong tires at the wrong Wonder Auto. So I have dropped off tires at Prospect Street and gone over to Main Street and go to unload them. They say, these are not our tires, and had to go back and get the right tires and leave the right tires with them and back and forth across the river. But uh, thankfully, I don't have anything to do with that. I don't label the stuff. I don't sticker it. It's just, uh, it just happens. In my job, stuff gets mislabeled. Uh, I could tell a story or two about how things ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time or ended up in my truck when they were supposed to be in somebody else's. and Somebody was getting a real good tongue lashing over the phone, but it weren't me because I didn't label it. <laughs> Oh, uh, let me see. Genesis chapter 45. That's a good place to go. Genesis chapter 45, verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. Um, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I think that's pretty good. I noticed what he said. There, there's five more years, and there will be no earring or harvest. Um, a lot of the time, things bloom, but they don't, they don't make it all the way through the growth, the growth cycle. Joseph said, God showed me, he said, that it isn't gonna, it, they're not even going to turn, there's not even going to be a blossom at all. Nothing. And let alone try to get, because, you know, a blossom will give you some hope. And then you get to the harvest and you're discouraged because, hey, listen, it made it all the way. And now I've got nothing to show. And yet, that right from the very beginning of those seven years, he said nothing's going to even grow at all. Nothing. We got a couple of shrubs that way. My wife's always watching them. They just got little, they get these little tiny green buds on them. And you can only tell by, in your peripheral vision as you're walking by them, wait a minute, oh, they're starting to blossom. They're the ugliest looking things in the world until they start getting some leaves on them. And uh, so one of them's out, but the other one, she was looking awful close there last night. Maybe we cut it back too hard last year. I said, don't you worry about it. It'll be out with a vengeance before too very long. And, uh, but, that there's, we, but we know that, and Joseph knew from the get-go that there's nothing that, none of that's going to happen. He told Pharaoh that. So it was Pharaoh's dream. So whatever you, it's just not going to happen. All of the all the disease and, and, and death in the harvest is just going to take over. It's just at this point, and by the time two years in, Joseph said, "Listen, we just might as well get used to it. Nothing. You, you can put, we can plant all the seeds we want. They're not even going to come up. They're not even going to germinate. There's nothing. Wouldn't that get you all excited? 
It's, I mean, there's a mess. You get a word from the Lord and say, it's going to be really bad for the next seven years. We'd have a hard time with the next seven minutes. Some of the younger folks, if God told them and said, you're going to lose your cell phone over a seven-minute period, they would, didn't, wouldn't know what to do with themselves. I might get a text. My girlfriend might break up with me. I've had that happen in, cl in class in Bible school where I wouldn't allow them to use uh, electronic devices. They could not text. They could not send messages. And we were just kicking our, just killing ourselves laughing because this young fellow was sitting there in a second-year classroom. He was getting texts from his girlfriend in the middle of the class, and he's not allowed to answer it. And it's going like, you know, what you doing, da-da-da. And about three minutes later, he didn't answer. What's going on? Why are you not answering me? And three minutes later is, how come you're not talking to me? Are we breaking up? Now that I don't work there anymore, I can honestly say that we do, uh, deliberately one day for our own entertainment and amusement, one of the, me, myself and, and some students in a particular class at a particular Bible school in a particular place conspired together against the first year students and the students in the second and third year class would text them during class and when they answered it, I'd sweep in and take their phone or take their to iPad or take their laptop away from them and take it upstairs and just leave it. So they'd have to go like 45 minutes without it. They could go get it again, but they had to go half an hour or 45 minutes without their technology. And wow, did they, some of them pretty near lost their mind. And they never knew, and we never said anything. I don't think anybody ever said anything until now. We did it on purpose. Of course, I had to put my grumpy face on and act like they were doing something terribly horribly wrong. You're not allowed to do that. Take their stuff. <laughs> Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph's brother has come back to him. Now remember in chapter 45, and there's several years that are going to go by in between here, um, that Joseph had told them, you, you, know, you sold me into Egypt, but don't, don't be grieved or angry with yourself. God sent me here to do this. God sent me. Twice he said that. God sent me. But in Genesis 50, 20, their father's dead now. Jacob died. And that fear comes on them again. And in Genesis 50, 20, uh, chapter 50, early on, they go to him and say, you know, don't kill us. Because they figured now that his dad's dead, he just killed them all. And I mean, he had a right to do it, really. Uh, but in 50 and 20, he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You meant it for evil, God meant it for, get, for good, but, but here, you know, God intended to save you. And he, tell, he has to reaffirm to them, I'm not going to kill you. I know what you meant, and you meant it for evil. I know that, you know that, but God didn't. God meant it for good. And finally, uh, well, not finally, but there's a whole lot of Bible. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verses 8 through 10 so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. In Acts chapter 13, verses 29 and 30, it says, when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Talking about Christ. But God raised him from the dead. Joseph said, you men of evil, but God. And then in the book of Acts, of course, it's written about the crucifixion. They did all that was written of him. And I really I like that. We miss that. We miss that part all the time. They did what was written of him. They only did what the scripture said was going to be done. They didn't do any more and they didn't do any less. They did what was said was going to be done. And when the book said that not one bone in his body would be broken, 
Not one bone in his body was broken. Right down to the last little detail. Everything was done the way that it was supposed to be. And finally they said they took him down and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. So that's my, it's my, my deep thought for the evening. I know I'm supposed to be the deep one. I leaned over to my wife today. My sister-in-law was talking about, you know, I, I, I'm, the, I'm the one, the deep one, and she's got a simple little message, and then she made a remark after, after that, and none of you probably caught it, but I laughed, and I said to my wife, I said, I'm the deep one, and she's the one everybody can understand. <laughs> <laughs> Which sometimes happens, of course. But God, that's what I want to talk about, but God. But God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and for this opportunity to be here to share your word, to expound upon it. I pray, Lord, that you would use this, this, this clay vessel, and you would use this vessel to bless somebody's heart and mind, that your word we know is anointed. We know that it's going to touch our hearts and minds. Just anoint this clay. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. I have a larger iPad than I used to have, too. And new bifocals, so I'm having a lot of fun. I couldn't see for the longest while. I was worried that it was going to, uh, I thought maybe my eyesight was going. It turned out my glasses had all gone like grandma's windows. <laughs> That's what I said to the, uh, to the, to the optometrist. I said, my, I think it's my glasses. They look like grandma's windows. And he laughed. He said, I know what you mean. They kind of like, remember the old glass? You'd look out to it and you'd move your head around because it all warbled and wibbled and did all this kind of thing. And that's what my glasses were doing. The finish on them was gone. And so they gave me new ones, and it was like, wow, I've been missing so much. But then I still went out and got a bigger iPad so I could see it. Showing my age. The, the, we sometimes get into these messes. Do you ever notice that? We get into messes. We don't always make them. Sometimes we do. I'm pretty sure that the, more, the majority of the time that my biggest difficulty it presents itself to me in the mirror in the morning. I'm pretty sure. And uh, I, you know, I, I can get into trouble like a startup pretty easy. Uh, I can drive down the road, and, uh, it, and I can, things can happen, you know, in the car. I, I do remember driving down the road, and, and just randomly I said something to the passenger who was there, and, and it instantly... She was right there. She was right up. And she started, and I just leaned over to the dash to, the, to, the, to an invisible button, and I just went like this on the dash button, and she, she, she smote me. Because uh, <laughs> you do. After 32 years, you learn where the buttons are. It's just like, Ow. I can do that. It's just walk by. It's just, boom. <laughs> <laughs> so we get in we do get into stuff i know we get into trouble and we cause some for ourselves and sometimes it's caused for us we don't know what to do with ourselves i don't know too many of us that have been sold off into slavery there are people in this world that have been though and even in this country there are people in the streets in the cities of this country today tonight that are in slavery that are under the thumb of someone who has stolen them out of a foreign country somewhere and brought them to this country to be a slave. And that is, that is, that is not a lie, and that is not an exaggeration. Uh, and, and they are captives. Uh, and they've showed up here uh, un and were lied to, were brought here under false pretenses, and are not even allowed to leave the house. Uh, and or they're put out on the street, and they're not allowed to leave the street. So, uh, you know, most of us haven't had that. We haven't had that problem. We've, we've got our own difficulties. We've got our own problems and all of that kind of thing. But God, <laughs> that's the thing, that's the difference. And I, I say that uh, is the difference between us and a lot of other people. As a child of God, you, if you lie in the hospital bed and, and, and perhaps hope is is fleeting. The difference between perhaps you and, and the person next to you, 
uh, that is outside of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the difference is the destination. The difference is the hope that I have as opposed to the hope that they, they don't have. And, I mean, the scripture is, is replete with the, 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 the continual reminder. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. In other words, some people trust in human things and human resources. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And, and so when and I come back to this because I think, and, and I, I believe this very strongly because I, I've worked in areas. Of, when I started out, the first job I had was pumping gas, and the second job I had was working in the funeral home. And um, I came really quickly to understand that we talk about dying, but we don't, uh, we don't know how to do it very well. Uh, and, and, and it always kind of fascinated me, confused me, boggled my mind, whatever you want to say, that, 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 that the, the Christian community is always talking about heaven and always talking about glory and always talking about being in the, with God and I'll have a new body and I'll have a new life and I'll have all those kind of things. And we don't deal with the transition very well. Uh, we, you know, we go out holding on to the bed sheets and, uh, and, and, and fighting all along the way when in reality it, it, it ought not to be. We ought to be the easiest people. You know, when we're, in the, we're lying there in a terminal environment and, and uh, uh, we're, we're laying there and the doctors and nurses are tending to us and our family is there uh, in palliative care or in, in hospice care, they ought to be watching us go easy into the night. That, that's the way, that I, not fighting it. It's like, you're a child of God. Why would you be fighting all of these kinds of things? And we talk about that. We talk about the transition. We talk about dying. We don't die very well sometimes. And I think we ought to be dying better than most. That's just my, my two cents worth. But I think we ought to do it better than most anybody else because we have hope. I mean, we, we, are, we ought to be assured of that, and we are assured of that in the Word of God. I know where I'm going. I know, I know what's going to happen when I'm done. I know when I leave this, I'm going to tell you, this mortal shall be changed. And I, I know all of those kinds of things. And, and we ought to know that we pray for uh, my mother's healing, my father's healing, my grandmother's healing. She's 103, and she's passed on. And we sometimes get confused, and we resent God because a 103-year-old grandmother passed away. Well, how long do you want to hang on? I mean, uh, they're, they're not going to live like Methuselah, 969 years. We don't have that promise anymore. The Bible says 70 years after that, you got grace. That's, that, that's it. Uh, but as a child of God, we pray for a, we pray for a healing, and and uh, you know then then we're upset that they passed. But but God healed them. That's the thing I'm coming to is that God healed them. God did heal them. Didn't heal them the way you wanted them to. But but God did heal them. God gave them a brand new body. If you're praying and your car is is uh, is busted and you're having problems with it. You know, you don't resent the fact that somebody says, listen, I'm not going to repair what you got. You know, I, I'm just going to give you another one. I mean, there, I, I begin to question sometimes if, if somebody's driving, you know, uh, the classics. I'm thinking of the classic cars, you know, 1987 uh, Plymouth Reliant or something like that. And, you know, you're, 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 <laughs> you're, driving, uh, you're driving your Plymouth Reliant, and that thing's shaking you pretty near to death, and it's on its last legs. And somebody comes along and says, you know, you're thinking it should be fixed. And they say, no, um, no, I, I'm just going to give you another one. I just give you a brand new one. And you get upset some way or another. I don't know why you would, but you get upset because they give you a new car as opposed to fixing the one that you got. And I think insofar as our, our, this, this mortal form is concerned, it ought to be the same way. Rather than, you know, my brother-in-law, my stepbrother-in-law, my stepsister's husband, remarked at my grandmother's funeral. He said, your funerals are a whole lot different than, than a lot of the funerals I've been to. I mean, they're, they're downcast, they're downtrodden. I've been to some that lasted 20 minutes, and they were the boringest funeral I've ever been in my entire life. And, and uh, then you go into a funeral where the person was a child of God and everybody's upbeat and they're, they're, you know, they're, they have hope and they, they're, they're, everybody is, you know, we cry, tears are there, but it's, it's, it's not the same. And people outside of the church, can, uh, can, they get that. They, they don't understand it, but they get, look, these people are a lot happier about this. 
uh, than, than it seems like the rest of us are. It's because we have hope. And so Grandma exchanged uh, the classic for a brand new one. And, and uh, our other friends or relatives, they just laid down the old and picked up the new. I don't know why I said that, but I wanted to say that because um, the, here it is, you know, we're, we're, it looks like there's no hope, but God said this mortal shall put on immortality. Yes, but God, and I mean, those are exciting words, but God, I don't, I don't care. You go through the Bible, you can find all kinds of incidences where somebody's back was against the wall and then God stepped in. It seemed like out of the blue. Of course, it wasn't, but it seemed like it. When all hope was lost, God stepped in. And so, uh, but God, man did his, his best to fight against God. Man did his best even to attempt to kill him as much as you could kill God and crucify him and laid him in a tomb. But, but God, but God was greater than man's sin. And God was greater than man's rebellion. And God was greater than man's uh, anger. And God was greater than all that. And God rose in triumph over sin and death. And the book says that if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will also quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwells in you. It will put life in you. That same spirit that raised him from the dead. Well I'm feeling discouraged. And we all would. If I lost my mother. I would be discouraged. To a point. <coughs> we lose our mom. We're discouraged to a point. Lose our dad. We're discouraged to a point. But if they're a child of God. It should stop at a certain point. I miss them being here. I miss them being next to me. I miss being able to pick up the phone. But God transitioned them from here to there. And that I don't resent. Well, there's an argument in Acts chapter 13, verses 29 through 37. It's a fairly lengthy passage, and, I, and I'm not going to read all of that, but I'll just highlight the points um, those, those 10 verses there, um, through 29 to 37, I, he uh, enumerates some things in Acts 13, 28, 29. The Jews put the innocent Jesus to death and then laid him in the grave. You know, when they fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. In verse 30 to 31, but God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. And the resurrection, by the resurrection, I possess, uh, I, I possess a hope and a glory and all of those things. But I have witnesses. It's not that people are saying that he rose from the dead. But the book records that he was seen of above 500 witnesses. 500. Now I've heard people say, then when so-and-so passed away, a few weeks later they got a visit from them in a dream and they were baking cookies and all that kind of thing. I had an aunt call my, my mother one time and my grandmother had passed away and my, my other, one of my aunts had passed away. So it was a great aunt. Uh, my grandmother's sister called my mother and she said, I had a dream the other night and, and Olive and Judy were baking cookies together in heaven. Now, now, I understand that and, you know, all the theology, but all the theology behind that, I don't, I don't see that in the book. They're not baking cookies any more than the men are out fishing goldfish down by the beautiful stream and doing whatever, living in a log cabin. You know, all those songs that we sing about, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. Um, I ain't having no cabin. I'm living in a mansion according to the Bible. I, I get a mansion. You can have your cabin, and I like cabins, but I'm taking the mansion because I ain't never had one down here, so I'm taking one <laughs> up there. <laughs> I like the song. Don't get me don't don't get me wrong. We we you know we we sometimes they're they're baking cookies or they're doing this and they're doing something else. And of course it's, it's an encouragement to the it's an encouragement to the mind. My grandmother died in the faith, and so it's an encouragement to the mind. Do, it's just that it, what it conveys. You know, if you're into interpreting dreams and all that, I just look at that and say, you know, I don't know about the cookie thing, but I I do know that they're at rest. They're, they're, they're in a place of hope and peace and joy, and they're doing what they want to do. They're doing what they enjoy doing. Now, in my mind, that's worshiping God because I figure that's about what we're going to be doing and a whole lot of it, and we're going to do it because we want to. Yes, sir. 
And, uh, and I'd be pretty excited. You close your eyes here and you wake up there and it's like, yes! <laughs> like to be able to do that in long airplane flights. God raised him from the dead. And, and, and then uh, between 32 and 33, it, it, it tells us in the resurrection of Christ that God fulfilled his promise to the fathers of Israel uh, because it's a resurrection which is the great proof of his Messiahship. That was the one great proof of that Messiah was Messiah was that he was killed and that he rose from the dead. That's the one thing that's going to, of course, if you're into prophecy and all of that, that's the one thing that's going to convince a lot of people that, that the, the, the beast is Messiah because he receives his great wound in his head and he's killed, but then he raises back up again. And people are going to say, oh, this must be the Messiah. And, of course, it's not the case at all because that's already been done. You know, I, I don't like copycats. You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> be yourself. Figure out something else to do, but don't go around. That's already been done. It's already been wounded, already been killed, already rose from the dead. You're a fake. Of course, the church folk would say that, but we'll already be gone. And, and so, here, here, verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. Now, I go back to Joseph. What a story. 17-year-olds, 17, 17 and I was 17 for an entire year, so I got 12 months' experience doing that. And uh, I've discovered that some things are better off not shared. You... you they just not. When you're 17 or so and you have a dream that your mother and father and all your brothers are going to bow down and worship you. You picture that. You're 17 years old and you, your mother and father, most of the time, they're 10 years high. They are not going to be Because you never ever saw your mother doing this to your father saying, I worship the old green king. <laughs> Most of the time, us men got to twist the scriptures just to quote a Bible verse that says, if you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> but that was Jesus who said that, not me. <laughs> so you tell your mother and father that, and they're just like, this kid, this kid is cracked in the head. There's something wrong with him. We'll just get him a coat of many colors and send him out there somewhere. He can have a good time. And the bro but the brothers are like, we are not bound because that's what brothers do. And I will not bow to you, mister. And so they conspire together, throw him in a hole. Eventually he's sold off into slavery, and he ends up down there. I've preached on that so many times. He's end up down in slavery in Egypt in Potiphar's house. And then first thing you know, he's running the show. He's in looking after the house. And then he discovers that the boss's wife is nuttier than a fruitcake. And she's chasing him around, come lie with me, come lie with me, which is King James for something else altogether. And uh, we got new drapes in the master bedroom, why don't you come see them? That was essentially what she was saying, come on upstairs. And he's running away and running away and running away. Finally, when she, when she really went after him, he just said, I cannot do this against God. He didn't even mention his master. He just said, I cannot do this thing against God. And he took off. She grabbed his coat and kept it. And then the lion thing turned around, went to her husband and said, look, your, your, your little servant there, Joseph, he tried to accost me and molest me. And here I, he, he left his coat behind. And I read that over and over and over again. And, and in my mind, because I've always you know, got this, this sense of, some other things that are going on. I understand a little bit about history. I understand that even 150 years ago, you get caught running around with somebody else's wife, they're liable to shoot you right fair in the head. You know? And so uh, 3,000 years ago, you get caught running around your boss's wife, and you're going to lose your head. They're not just going to shoot you in the head. They're going to take it off. Uh, I don't know what on earth the baker did but you cook the bread the wrong way in Pharaoh's house, and it's over. So here's Joseph being accused of, of, of making advances to his boss's wife, and his boss takes him and throws him in prison. And you're thinking, because my mind, I'm thinking, what's he do that for? And then it was like, it's not a revelation, but because I have just, I got a twisted mind. I'm thinking, 
He got him out of there because he wanted to protect Joseph from his wicked wife. He probably in his mind he's saying, she's never, oh, I'd like to take her head off. I just, you know, that, that's the husband. See, Potiphar just saying, I'd like to kill her is what I'd like to do. And she's lying. I know she's lying, but I can't prove it. So I'm going to take Joseph and put him in prison because he'll be safer in prison than he is from her. I put him in jail. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder sometimes. Some folks probably ended up in jail just to protect them, more or less. Just because that's what happened to Joseph. I really believe that's what happened to Joseph. He just to protect him. Got him down. Why? Because it isn't very long. He was second in command in Potiphar's house, and it isn't very long he's second in command in the jail. Yeah. So somebody somewhere had some confidence in the guy. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, not everybody believes every story they hear. And sometimes, you know, I would see people, they'd say something about somebody and then something happens. They say, look, see, they believe me. It wasn't really true and I was lying. But, but they believe me. No, they didn't necessarily believe you. They might have just got so-and-so away from you. Just saying. And he gets down there and, 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 he's, and he's running the show again. Because there, the admin, you know, they're, they're doing things, watching things and all of that. He's got any major issues, you go to them. But essentially he runs the place. And, and there he is with two other guys one day having a conversation. And up they come with the dreams. And, uh, of course, the cupbearer, the butler, is saying that I had a dream and this, that happened. And the baker says, boys, I was walking down the street and had a great big basket of bread on my head. And the birds came and they were pulling the, all of the bread off of that and everything. And Joseph looks at them and, and uh, he smiles, you know, at the cupbearer. He says, you know, three days from now, you're going to get your job back. It's a wonderful thing. And the baker is standing there probably thinking to himself, wow, if he's getting his job back, I'm probably going to get my job back too. Because he says that, that, jo that Pharaoh's going to lift up my head head, you know, we're, here you go, get, you can have your job back, don't be so sad. And then Joseph says, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head from off your body. <laughs> kind of hard on you, you know, when you're going around and God speaks to you and it's always just bad stuff's going to happen. Because Joseph says, you guys are going to bow to me. And under what circumstances would that happen? You have to ask yourself. It's not just we're having a party and let's, they're all excited and say, well, look at little Joey. Isn't he a wonderful kid? Let's all bow in front of him. Usually, obeisance is made under stressful circumstances. They're faced to the floor because of something that has happened. Right? And, and so I can't imagine what would happen, they're thinking. And, and then... You're the butler. I mean, the cupbearer, he's, he's, he's excited. Everything's going to be wonderful, but you're the cupbearer. You know, you're the cupbearer, and you're going back, but you're looking at, and you're thinking, man, dodge the bullet there. The baker's not going to be so lucky. Imagine being told in three days you're going to get your head taken off because you mixed up the cakes or something. Gave the king the Joe Louis instead of a flaky. I mean, <laughs> this guy's got a just a really bad disposition. You're overly sensitive. If you're asking, you know, if Brother McCoy says, I'm going to bring you a pineapple bread, and he doesn't, it's just plain white bread, and you're so ticked off you want to kill him. <laughs> I don't care what kind of bread he brings me. I just, just bring the bread. I'm happy. Right. You know, but, but here, here, here's all this. And this has happened. And to be sitting there, and bad enough you're sitting there and the poor guy next to you is being told he's going to die, let alone being the guy that's told that you're going to die. And then imagine that, 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 that this guy goes back to his job, this guy gets executed, and two years go by, and all you said to the guy that survived is, remember me when you're standing in front of Pharaoh. And then two years go by and nothing happens. Most of us don't like waiting in line. We will jockey for position driving down the highway. I would say that we could probably reduce our mileage by about 30% if we stopped changing lanes thinking the other one's going faster than we are. Because it's true. It is statistically so. 
statistically proven. Now, there are scientists and engineers and all that, traffic engineers, that, that study this stuff. I mean, I, I study strange things. They study this stuff. And they have discovered that the guy weaving from lane to lane to lane to lane, trying to get ahead and racing over, that lane's moving faster, and he jumps over there, and it, it races ahead, and then all of a sudden it comes to a dead stop, and the guy is just kind of going along there at five kilometers an hour, finally creeps up beside him, waves at him, and keeps right on going, and he's you know, got like a tortoise in the hair. And he goes right on by him. And it's statistically proven that doing that doesn't get you where you're going any faster. You're not going. You think you're going faster, but you're not actually progressing any faster than you ever did before. And so you, you can imagine that it was sitting waiting. We wait in line. We'll jump from one grocery line to the other line, you know. And we'll, I mean, we'll have nine items and we'll drop an item or try to sneak that item through on the eight items or less kind of aisle because we're in such a hurry. And then we find out that whoever's in front of us has got eight items or less, but it's like eight cases of something or other, and there's no price tag on them and now they're going to be the next 20 minutes hunting for somebody down in bottled water aisle to figure out what the price is of that and you're standing there with your hands in your pockets and the guys over there where there were 13 people in the line are all gone but you're in the eight items or less and I should be moving faster that's why we got a microwave we want everything to go faster and, and so imagine Joseph in jail he's still second in command all of that but he's waiting and waiting and waiting and the butler forgot all about him. Then Pharaoh has a dream, and it's not a good dream. And he needs an interpretation because he doesn't understand why uh, basically skeletized cows are eating healthy, chubby cows and, and why these, these blown-out ears of corn are consuming the good ears of corn. And so he doesn't know. And even the magicians come and all of the interpreters, and nobody knows and finally, the butler says, wait just a second. Two years ago, I was down in jail, and I met this little Hebrew fella by the name of Joe that was interpreting dreams, and he told me I was getting my job back, and he told the, the baker he was going to die. And guess what? It happened. Maybe you ought to send for him. And Pharaoh sends for Joseph, and Joseph cleans himself up and, and washes himself to go before the king which I think is a good idea if you're going to go before the king. You ought to, you know, just be excited about it and present yourself, you know, in a worshipful manner, all of that kind of thing. He shows up, and the king tells him about it, and Joseph says, this is what's going to happen. You better start saving now because there's going to be seven good years, and then there's going to be seven years that are going to wipe out everything. Wow. Isn't that exciting? Not really. And in all of this, in all of this trouble, in all of this trial, in all of this distress, the brothers finally show up. After Joseph, now it's probably been about 13 years or so that has gone by. And Joseph is there, and now he is bilingual, probably multilingual. He's not just speaking Hebrew, but he's speaking the Egyptian language and who knows how many others. Uh, and they, those brothers come before him, and he knows who they are. They don't know who he is. And he, he's giving them the runaround. I mean the runaround. He's giving them a runaround. He locked them up, and then he let them, made the other ones go away. They locked up a younger brother, and then he keeps another one, and he does all this kind of jerking them around all over the place. And finally, he reveals himself, and they are on their face. I wonder if the light went on for Judah or for Reuben when they fell on their face in front of Joseph and then suddenly looked up and said, oh, he was right all along. I wonder, you know, and, and, but then they're still worried and they're worried about him killing them and he's got to re reaffirm to them, I'm not going to kill you. You meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And of course, uh, Joseph uh, was very much a type of Christ in the Old Testament, probably one of the purest ones in the Old Testament. Um, and, uh, you know, he's only, he's only got one wife, which is great. I mean, it, it, right from one detail to the other, your pastor knows all of that. We just sit and talk for hours, and our wives are like, <sighs> what are they talking about? Get into types and tabernacles, and everybody's eyes glazes over. And the rest of us are just like, <laughs> we're going to talk about Joseph. 
And Joseph only had one bride. See, Christ only has one bride. There's only got one church. There aren't 14 of them. There aren't all these. There's just one. There's one bride, period. And Joseph, of course, like Jesus, was falsely accused. He didn't do anything. He was falsely accused. And, and Jesus was eventually crucified as a, as a result of being falsely accused. But, but God. And Joseph was thrown in a dungeon. But, but God. He was thrown in a pit. But God. And he's put in part of his house as a servant. But God made him second in command. And then he's lied about. But God delivered him out of that. And then he's in jail. And, but God puts him in there again. Running the jail essentially. And then... All, then he's locked up. He's still there and he's waiting for two years. But God is getting things ready. And he bounces from one thing to another. From, from being a teenager to being in a hole, up out of the hole on the way to, to Egypt, to slavery. And bounces from that down into prison and from prison to second in command. How many people do you know that go from jail to being the, the vice regent to the leader of the nation? How many people in this country have ever gone from jail to being the, the, the second to the prime minister? Not very often that happens. I dare say you hunt around, you ain't going to find anybody that that happened to. And yet Joseph goes from that to that. And we sort of get down sometimes and I wonder what God is doing. I wonder what, but he's getting everything all ready for you to bounce from one thing to another. Abraham Lincoln in the history of the United States, I don't know how many things he ran for. He ran for stuff. He was running in every election you could think of. And I, I forget what the number was. I don't know it was like 52 things or something. It was some enormous number. He ran for this office and that office and some other office and debated people in one thing or another and never won one of them. He lost every single thing he ran for until one day he got out of bed and he looked at his wife and said, I've lost. Every election I ran in, the only one I didn't run in was for president of the United States. I may as well give that a go. And he wins. And he emancipates slaves. Sets them free. Imagine. And who else might have done that? But the Bible says that God elevates kings. Sets some up, sets some down. God does that. Isaiah said that a hundred years before it even happened, Isaiah said that Cyrus was going to come and break into Babylon and overcome the Babylonians and put them under his thumb. And you would think, well, the Israelites and God's people are now they're going from the Babylonians under the thumb of the Medes and the Persians and everything like that. But it's 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 the leaders of other nations that have them under captivity that finally say to them, here, here, Ezra, here, Nehemiah, here's a letter. I'm going to send you back to Jerusalem. I want you to rebuild your own city because they're all upset about Jerusalem being knocked down and the walls are all falling down. And under Nehemiah, they go from, from a city that is in ruins into a complete revival in just 52 days. They rebuilt a city in 52 days. We have, we have folks that can't build a bridge in that amount of time. And they rebuild an entire city. In 52 days, you say, here we are, we're down, but God, we're going into captivity, but God, it's going to be 70 years, but God, and but God gives us a letter, but God allows the king of a, of a wicked nation to allow us to go back and rebuild. The walls are falling down, but God has sent us, but God is going to allow us to build, but God is going to raise it up again, but God is going to have a city, but God. are falling apart but God we're up against the Red Sea but God we're up against the Jordan but God we've got God King of Asia but God there's the walls of Jericho but God and in the process of the walls falling they meet Rahab who had been in Harlan I think she was transitioning out of that job myself because there were flax on the roof and gals that were doing what she had been doing for a living generally didn't work in the fields 
and there are flax on the roof of her house. And, so, and, and, I, and I'm, I come to believe that, I really kind of believe that because she says to the spies, to Salmon and Boaz, she said, we've been listening to the stories. We've been hearing about all King of Bashan and the Red Sea and the Jordan River and all of this kind of thing. And our hearts are melting within us. You look around town. People are scared to death of you Israelites. And I believe your God is God of heaven above and earth. I, I, I believe all of that. There's this transition going on. But God. But God. And things are falling apart. But God. Things are breaking down. But God. People are dying. But God. Walls are at distance. But God. Rivers in front of us. But God. And during Christ's crucifixion, he was there with two others. Joseph is in a dungeon with two other men. Christ crucified with two other men, thieves, one of which was saved and the other which was lost. And Joseph's in a jail cell accompanied by a butler and a baker, and one of them was restored and the other lost. And Joseph came from the dungeon jail and exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. Christ was exalted to the right hand of the throne of God. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the book of Revelation, you see him at the right hand, a place of authority and power. Going from a grave, from a jail to a grave, to an open grave and ascended. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I like the part about the two men with each of them. Remember that Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph sold for 20. And sold into slavery, sold away. It didn't go so well for those that sold them. And I had nothing to do with that. And, and Joseph had nothing to do with that at all. But God. But God. And your heart can be broken but God. And you can be down and out, but God. And you can be discouraged, but God. And you can lose your job, but God. The company I work for is, on, I mean, they, they've transitioned now, I don't know how many times, just the last little while, the turnover is crazy where I work. And, um, uh, and then they sold half the company. They didn't even tell the employees, essentially, I found out from the company that bought them because I make deliveries there and I know people that work for the other company that bought the company, that <laughs> half the company that I was working for, and they told me, they said, hey, we're, bu we're buying out your waste management outfit. Really? I didn't know anything about that. Of course, I didn't work for waste management, so it wasn't going to affect me a whole lot. But all those guys, were suddenly they were told, said, we're selling the company. You're going to be offered jobs with the new company. But there's nothing here. So if you like us, that's fine, but you can't stay. And part of the management, part of the office, some of the office workers were told, it's over there or no job at all. And they had to go. And they didn't have any choice. And then there were some that were inside of the company that had a certain job, and then they were brought in and told, said, we're going to transition you out of that. You're going to be doing something else because we don't have half the company anymore, so we're changing things around. Here's what we're offering you. You've still got a job if you want it, but this is your option. There are no other options. You can take it, or we'll lay you off, and you can go home. So they had to take it. And so you never know. You, 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 there's no way of knowing. You, you, can, you, can, you can be around forever and suddenly think everything is wonderful. I mean, you, you have to be, we're just thankful. I work from, with some men that go to church. I work for a man that goes to church. And, uh, and uh, we just, you know, you have to go with the mindset. Yes, sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes I don't like doing what I'm doing on every day. Um, when it's 39 below, I don't really like it that much because I'm outdoors. Uh, but you say, well, I couldn't, I could be without, I could be without it, all of that. And, and, and so I, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful for this, thankful for that job, thankful for that opportunity, thankful because there, I know men, I pastored men that worked for the same outfit for 35 years or more. And then one day they walked in and said, we sold the mill and uh, we're shutting it down. And oh, by the way, your pension money's gone. What do you do? But God. And God stepped in. 
And one of the men, one of the wives, there was a, a, a lady that went to our church uh, that I pastored. Her husband never went to church. He was a grandson of one of our Pentecostal preachers. But he didn't go to church. And, uh, and so, you know, I'd, I'd visit with him. He's friendly. He's a nice man and everything like that. And we'd visit and we'd talk and all of that kind of thing. And it wasn't until some years after I wasn't pastor there anymore that he finally came around. And, uh, and the Lord began to deal with him. And he had lost all of that, lost that pension, lost all of that kind of thing. But God, but God began to deal with him. And God got a hold of him. And God saved his life. And God saved his soul. God saved him baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, regenerated life. He was so excited and all, and people that used to work with him said, you know, I used to know him before Christ and I know him now. All he, and now all he wants to do is talk about Jesus. Uh, my Jesus. He's talking about my Jesus all the time. My Jesus this. My Jesus that. My Jesus something else. My Jesus. And then of course recently he passed away. Uh, but he went home in the faith. He died in the faith. And I'm thinking to myself, if all of that happened and it was just to engineer that one man's salvation, then that ought to be something that the rest of us church folk are excited about. Some of us may have lost their job. And some of us may have lost something that we were promised. But God had a bigger plan. But God, you can look like you're at the end of the road. But God, but God. And it's all in how you interpret things. Let's stand together because our perception, you know, our perceptions are quite something. We perceive things differently. All of us perceive things differently. And some of us will hit the wall and smile, and some of us are not even anywhere near that wall. And are, we're just breaking. We're crumbling into pieces. And yet in all of this, throughout all of the scriptures, God was instrumental in things that were complete disasters. I mean, none of us have been swallowed by a whale. Now, I know, Jonah was being rebellious. And he had to end up in the belly of that whale in order to get into the prayer meeting that was he could have had before. Because prayer meetings are easy. You bend your knee and you go at it. But Jonah, the, the, the prophet of God, because we miss that part. We read that and we skip that part about Jonah being the prophet of God. And he was a prophet of God. He was God's man. He was anointed of God. And he was, he was a discriminator. He was a bigot. He was prejudiced. And in his mind, I'm not going over to that country to preach the message to those people because I don't care if they do get saved. That was his thinking. And he said that to God in the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah. He gets arguing with God. He said, see, look at that. I knew, you knew what I knew, that if I come over here to preach, these people are going to repent, and they're going to want to serve you, and they're going to want to love you. And frankly, I didn't want it to happen. That's why I didn't come. But God, he's, he's running away, but God, he's getting in the ship, but God, <laughs> he thinks everything's going to be wonderful, but God, and then the storm comes up, and they're throwing everything out except people at the time, and, and then it's like, I better confess, and he says, I'm the reason we're in the mess we're in anyway, you may as well throw me overboard, didn't take any convincing from those guys either, they just grabbed him by the nap of the neck of the seat of the pants, and pfft, over he went into the side, into the water, and God prepared a great fish. See, God is always in the middle of all this, but God prepared a great fish, and the fish came up and went, whoop, thank you very much, and he went into an immediate prayer meeting. And he prayed until the fish regurgitated him. <laughs> and it was, uh, when he hit the water and come out of the water onto the sand, he was headed straight for Nineveh. There was no pass and go. There was no collect $200. He was straight to Nineveh. I don't uh, God has given me a message. Yes, and it was an eight-word sermon. Every one of us would like the preacher to have an eight-word sermon. Wouldn't you just get up on the old soapbox and say, And 
And they took the repentant. They repented to the point where they made the cows repent. Sackcloth and ashes on everybody, including the cows. We're all repenting. Now, I don't know what the cow did. But they were repenting. They dedicated everything. That was, it. That was the essential idea. They, 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 when you really, really, really get right with God, you dedicate everything, not just some of your stuff. Everything you've got is in God's hands. And, and then, so, so then now it's God's. So God can do whatever he likes, and he can give it to you. He can take it away. He can let you manage it. He can take it back. He can let you lose everything you got. Because God's not in the business of worrying about your stuff. God's in the business of worrying about you. Because your stuff is not going. Now, I know. I've seen the Facebook pictures of somebody going with a, a hearse and a U-Haul trailer hooked to the back of it. Now, I know. It wasn't a funeral home. It was somebody had bought it at an auction, and they were going wherever and thought it would be funny. But when the, when the hearse heads for the cemetery, it's not taking a U-Haul trailer, and you ain't taking your stuff. And the last suit you wear, you ain't got no pockets. Because you can't take it with you. Because God's concerned about, he's not even concerned about this. God's not even concerned that this falls on the side of the road and is left there. He's not concerned about the funeral. He's not concerned about the words. He's not confer- concerned about the songs. He's concerned about this soul. And so you think everything's going wrong and everything, and suddenly you find yourself here and you're thinking, I really, I, everything's falling apart and I've got to get right with God. Then it's God. And everything that may have happened to bring you to this point was engineered for that purpose. And you can lose everything you got, but know that God is in the middle of it every time. I'd finish out by saying, by mentioning, and I'm not going to go too far into it, but Jesus, after the crucifixion and everything, the boys are out fishing again. And and they didn't catch anything. And these guys are professionals. They're professional fishermen. They, they are not amateurs. They are not hobby fishermen. They fish for a living. They know where the fish are. They knew where to go. And there's no fish. And then they get this question. Children, have you any meat? I, God's got a sense of humor. He said, did you catch anything? No. Because... I think he knew if they had any luck, they'd go back to doing what they were doing instead of doing what he wanted them to do. Because his last words were go into all the world and preach the gospel. <coughs> and they were headed back to the fishing. And sometimes God does not allow us to succeed because God has another plan and another idea. And you look around and say, I don't understand. I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I've got good managerial skills, and I don't understand why that guy started that company, and it is just booming, and I do the same thing, and mine won't work. Because God has another plan. So you know that God is in everything that happens. Everything. Nothing happens without him knowing about it or being involved. Plain and simple. And sometimes his involvement is to just step back and say, you want to do it yourself? I'll watch and see how that works. I keep telling you over and over and over again, 
and it is written in my word, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If you would seek my will and my purpose first in your life, you say, I'm not in the ministry, I'm not a preacher, but you still need to seek my will and my purpose first before you make any decisions because I'll bless what I want to bless, not what you want me to bless, not what you hold up to me to bless, but what I want to bless because I have a design and a purpose. I have something that I want for you to do. You're worried about finances. You're worried about me providing or about somebody else providing, writing letters and writing emails and, 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 and asking for the funds. If I'm in it and I am in it, I will provide. I will meet each and every need. When I am involved and you keep me involved, I will meet every need. And you will go farther on what I give you, though you may think it is small. What I give you will take you farther as the manna did in the wilderness. It will take you farther than the meat that you desire. It will take you farther than the things that you seek after that you think you should have. That thing, that item will last longer when it is by my hand and given by my hand than it ever will when it is done by your design. Seek me first. Ask me first. Knock on my door first before you knock on anyone else's, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's come around this altar. Praise God.